heard a startling fact as I was getting ready to come into church this morning regarding Memorial Day. And this is the fact I heard. I heard that from the Revolutionary War until today, over a million and a quarter people have given their lives in our nation's service, serving in our military, men and women who paid an ultimate price for the liberty that we enjoy as Americans. That's a powerful thing to hear, isn't it? And after I heard that, I began thinking about what that means, that a million and a quarter lives have been given uh, for the freedom that we take for granted. And then I thought, you know, and of that million and a quarter, the overwhelming majority of them were very young people, which means that we had wives who spent a lifetime apart from someone they loved and husbands who went through years without their wives and children who grew up without their fathers or their mothers generations that were affected because of the sacrifice of those who gave their lives away it really makes you think doesn't it that memorial day is not just a barbecue day is it it's a day to remember and a day to be grateful so I am grateful for those who have prepared the food that we're going to enjoy together in a few moments and we always enjoy this annual tradition but more than that we are grateful for those who gave their lives and paid the sacrifice so let's take a moment and let's pray why don't we Father, we do want to pray thanking you for Memorial Day. Lord, we remember that it started out as a, a day of remembering folks who gave their lives only in the First World War, but then it expanded to remember those who have died in our nation's service from the very beginning until today. And Lord, we are grateful. Father, we're grateful for those in this room today who have served in the military and are serving yet today. But, Father, we're especially grateful for those who gave their lives away, some very, very far from home. And, Father, they sacrificed themselves that we might enjoy liberty. Lord, help us to be worthy of that sacrifice. And help us, Lord, on this Memorial Day to take a moment to remember that which others have given as a gift that we might enjoy liberty. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Isaiah begins by saying this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Isaiah 6 offers a description of the day when the priest Isaiah had an experience that changed him forever. I would say it this way. He made his way toward the temple as a priest, but when he walked away, he was a prophet. Not only a prophet, maybe the greatest prophet that God ever called out in all of the Old Testament. It came on a day when he was remembering a very special sacrifice. He says, in the day, in the year that King Uzziah died, and unless you know who Uzziah was, then you don't understand exactly what Isaiah was talking about. Uzziah was one of the great kings of the people of God. He led and served his people for 50 years. And in those 50 years, he was a just king. He was a good king. He was a visionary king. He was a godly king. Generations had been born and died and known nothing but the leadership that Uzziah provided and the stability that he gave to the people of God. When he died, it was an earthquake among God's people, particularly because so many other things were going on at the same time. No wonder Isaiah wanted to take some time to remember and think about the sacrifice of the king. And really that's what Memorial Day is all about. It's about remembering those who sacrificed their lives in order that a nation could be everything that it was born to be. Their blood was spilled over two world wars in Korea and Vietnam and Iraq, Afghanistan, around the world and through the history of this nation. And it's important that we set aside a day to remember 
and that it stir up some special feelings in our lives of humility and gratitude and dedication and appreciation. In the same way, we as believers are called to remember as well, to remember those whose example has inspired us, to remember those whose sacrifice for the name of Jesus has been part of the history of our nation and of our world, those who are willing to give their lives away for the sake of Christ Jesus. And most of all, we are called to remember the Lord. You see, when you remember the Lord and you remember what he's done for you, it changes your prayer life. And Isaiah 6 reveals the story of what happened to Isaiah on that day when he encountered God. An encounter that transformed his life from absolute defeat to utter victory. You see, when, when Isaiah made his way to the temple that day, he went as a man with the world on his shoulders. You cannot imagine what it meant to him when he said, the king has died. The king has died. And everything has changed. There was a vacuum of leadership among the people of Israel. Enemies surrounded the nation on the other side. People were rejecting the Lord and all of his ways. And nobody knew what was going to happen next. Isaiah was a priest with a burden that was breaking his heart. He was burdened for himself. He was burdened for his family. He was burdened for his people. Wherever he turned, he looked around and he thought, the world is out of control. Everybody's turning in other ways. Everybody is serving other gods. People are rejecting what they have always believed. I don't see any way to save our nation. He needed to believe there was some kind of hope and some kind of future for God's people. But the truth is, Isaiah was the picture of a beaten man as he stumbled his way toward the temple that day. He was discouraged. He was used up. He was all hoped out. It was this broken man and not a spiritual giant who said in his in chapter 6 I saw the Lord when he saw the Lord everything changed and maybe this memorial day many of us need the same experience that Isaiah had you look around yourself and you see a world that seems to be running away from God as fast as it can go you look within yourself and you recognize I need a dose of hope you need to see the Lord just as he really is. Just the way Isaiah did. So I want to talk to you this, moment, this morning about Isaiah and this encounter he had with God. But more than that, I want to talk to you about the encounter that you can have with God as well. The prayers that Isaiah prayed are prayers that we can pray as well. And when we do, they will touch and transform your life. So I want you to hear the story of Isaiah, but I want you to recognize this is your story too. And God is talking to you in a powerful way. And the first thing I want you to see is this. Isaiah was given a huge vision of a great God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. You know, most of my life when I've read that passage, I've always had kind of the same vision of Isaiah walking into the doors of the temple and discovering that he's in a room filled with holy smoke and at the front in the place of the Holy of Holies, there's this great throne and seated on the throne is the Lord Almighty and on both sides of the temple are seraphim and they're crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What a powerful vision that was. But you know what? That is not the situation as Isaiah described it. In fact, to have that kind of vision of what was going on is to sell the Lord woefully short. Let me tell you what Isaiah was telling us all about. It was about Isaiah making his way toward the temple. The house of God is still some way off. And suddenly, he is struck with dumb amazement. 
Because filling the sky above the temple as far as he could see is a vision of the Lord seated on the throne. A Lord who is too majestic, too amazing to fit in any temple made by men. He sees the Lord and the Lord is all he can see. In fact, the Bible says this, the temple was barely big enough to hold the tips of God's robe. And there was no space inside the temple for those angels. Instead, they're flying. They're flying around this majestic vision of God. And the sky is thundering with their worship. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. At that moment, for Isaiah, the glory of God was everything. Everything. As far as he could see to the left, as far as he could see to the right, as high as he could see above him, the whole earth is full of the glory of God. Astounding. Why did the Lord reveal himself to Isaiah in such an awesome way? And the answer is simple. Because Isaiah needed a vision of the greatness of God. You see, other things had come to the point that they occupied all of his time and all of his attention. He convinced himself that the biggest thing in his world was troubles. He was so burdened that he started to believe his obstacles were too huge to overcome. Isaiah was making his way to the temple and he thought, my life is falling apart, my world is falling apart, my faith is falling apart, everything is falling apart. And then he saw God as he really is. Isaiah needed a fresh experience of how vast and powerful our God truly is. Now, here's the thing I want you to think about in the midst of of all of this. And this is not just one time when God fills the glory of creation. That's the way it always is. The whole earth is full of his glory. Not just one time for one man, but all the time, everywhere, every moment. The miracle was not that God was there. The miracle is that God allowed Isaiah to see it. He opened Isaiah's eyes and revealed himself in a way Isaiah would never forget. You know what happened to Isaiah on his way to the temple that day I couldn't see it it was there but I couldn't see it and now I can holy 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 is the Lord God almighty and there are times when that is just what all of us need We need a fresh vision of the greatness of God. There's some of us here today whose vision of Jesus has been impaired by the obstacles and the troubles you're facing in your life. And you've come today and really the truth is all you really could see were your burdens and your struggles and your hurt and your confusion. You look at the world around you and you wonder if sin is winning the day. It seems as though sometimes every day maybe Satan is winning the battle and where is the Lord in all of this? The truth is you may be feeling overwhelmed by the things you're facing in your own life today. Here is God's word for you. There is a living Savior who wants you to see him just the way he is. He wants to reveal himself in such a way that you will never forget. Now, you may not have a vision the way Isaiah had it, but he'll reveal himself to you right here inside. And he will be so real that you never realized how truly real he was until he opened your heart and opened your eyes so that you can see 
And he wants you to know that whatever might happen, he is in control. One of the great things that we can be sure of in the midst sometimes of a difficult world is this. There's no battle in the balance. There's no who's going to win. Is the Lord going to win? Is the devil going to win? Is it going to be righteousness or is it going to be sin? In fact, one of the things I love that we read in the Bible when we go through the book of Revelation is when the Lord decides to claim the victory, that's it. And it's done. And there's no battle and there's no conflict. There's victory. And the Lord wants you to know whatever may be going on in your world, whatever may be going on in your life, he is in control. Nothing is too big for him to handle. No sin is beyond his power to forgive and most of all he knows who you are so look above your problems and look beyond your struggles there he is he's the Lord and the Bible tells us this and because of that Isaiah experienced a transformed heart so I said woe is me for I am undone for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Understand something. This is Isaiah's first great prayer. It is a prayer of confession. It is a prayer of repentance. It is a prayer of submission. It is an honest prayer of a broken and surrendered heart. Isaiah fell down in the presence of absolute holiness. This is what I love. And there's no pretending that he's something that he's not. And there's no attempt to excuse the sin in his life. All there is is a surrender. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. God, I'm not trying to fool you. I'm not trying to justify myself. I'm not trying to excuse myself. I am falling before you in absolute surrender. That always happens when you have a real encounter with God. You realize again that God is great and you are small. Never once pretend to yourself that I deal with God the way an equal deals with an equal. He is God. And I am not. I'm concerned for myself sometimes when I think about how casual I can be in my relationship with God. How superficial my prayers can become. And how much I realize I need a new vision of God's holiness. Because here's the thing, you will never see him as he is without also seeing yourself as you are. You know, one thing would be true if we had an encounter with God. If he showed himself up in this place the way he did with Isaiah, I'm pretty sure that never again would I casually walk out the doors of this room when a service is over. I would be dumbstruck by the very presence of the Lord. Isaiah was broken until God did something astounding. God touched him. He said to him, behold, this has touched your lips. He's talking about a coal that he sent an angel to touch Isaiah with. This has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Now, here's the gospel in a nutshell. The Lord never wants anybody to be stuck at woe is me. God never wants anybody to come to the first point that Isaiah was and to think that's the end of it. I've seen God as he is. I recognize him in his holiness. I know I don't measure up. Woe is me. There's no hope. I'm broken. Instead, he wants you to know he is ready to touch you and make you clean. And he wants you to know this, and that touch will always be personal. It will always be between yourself and the Lord. When you have that encounter with God, it won't be God speaking to a whole group of people. It'll be God speaking to you, just you. And you will know he's talking to you. Did you see what the Lord said 
to Isaiah. He said, Isaiah, this is about you. Your lips, your iniquity, your sin. Isaiah, I'm talking to you. But you have to surrender to him. You make your own decision about how you're going to respond to this holy God. You have to be the one who kneels before his very presence. And that's exactly what happened to Isaiah. And he was broken and he would never be the same person again. He would be a man in the hands of God. No longer a priest, but a prophet. Ready to do whatever God wanted him to do. And that meant this. So Isaiah was ready to receive a blessing. He had seen the Lord high and lifted up. He had confessed his sin. He had felt the touch of saving grace. When he finally entered the temple, he knew he was standing beneath the blessing. And the place where grace fell down. He knew he had entered the temple to place his life exactly where it needed to be. And God gave him what he needed the most. Here's how Isaiah concluded the story. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. Which seems like a really good thing for a youth choir to say to the Lord as you're getting ready to go places, to sing to people, to serve people in the name of Jesus. Lord, here I am. Send me. And you do it as a group. But you also do it individually. In the depths of your own heart. You see, this is the ultimate personal prayer. Isaiah put his life and his future into the hands of God. And as he prayed that prayer, Isaiah understood. He was forgiven He was clean, and God had a future planned for his life. When Isaiah left the temple, he was a brand new man. No more fear, no more uncertainty. His eyes were not on the world around him or on his own failures. His eyes were on the Lord, and they would stay on the Lord for the rest of his life. And that gave him the boldness he needed to do whatever God wanted him to do, to go wherever God wanted him to go. Isaiah was a whole new man. Here I am, Lord. Whatever you want. He had walked in so afraid. Afraid of what was going on inside of himself. Afraid of what was going on in the world around him. Afraid for his people. Afraid for his faith. All of that's gone. It's never coming back again. Because he had the assurance. That God was going to do. What only God could do. What does that teach us? It teaches us there is no need to fear. When the Lord is in control. And there is no time. When the Lord is not in control. There's always a future. There's always a hope. When you put your life into the hands of Christ Jesus. And you say to him, Lord, I know you have a plan for my life. I know that you have something you want to do through me. I don't have to know everything. All I need to know is this. Lord, Here I am. Send me. Use me. Save me. Change me. Work through me. So I guess the question this morning is, is that something you're willing to do? Are you willing to simply say to the Lord, here I am. No conditions. No exceptions. 
Everything surrendered. Here I am. Maybe today you need to do that because you're not saved. You don't know Jesus Christ, not in a personal way. You may know all about him, but you don't know him. Maybe today you need to come, and I'll be glad to meet you here at the front and introduce you to Jesus Christ. Because he's the one who can save you. Put your life in his hands. Or maybe you need to become a part of what God is doing in this fellowship. Or maybe God's dealing with you in a very special, very specific way. And you just want somebody to come and pray with you. And you can come forward. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. As God speaks to your heart, you come. Let's stand together.